Okay, will we start it off? Um, good afternoon, everyone, and you're very welcome to this Ashray Ireland webinar. And we're delighted to be able to welcome Michal O'Connella, app an applications engineer with Cyrus Building Energy Solutions. And um, he's going to join us here today to um, discuss the carbon footprint reduction with CO2 heat pumps. My name is Tony O'Keefe, and I'll be chairing today's session. And um, I'm just going to cover a few things to start off with. So I hope you can see all that, you can all see that. So just as an introduction, we're going to just cover some small housekeeping in relation to the, the webinar, the functionality on the GoToWebinar, some of our upcoming um, events, um, and the ASHRAE, uh, ASHRAE Ireland Learning, oh, sorry, the ASHRAE Learning Institute. And then I'll be handing over to Michal for the, the technical talk. So, um, in case you haven't joined us before, I just want to highlight a few points regarding the GoToWebinar. Um, all attendees are muted by default, but if you'd like to ask a question, please use the questions tab or chat function to submit your query. And we'll do our best to answer uh, it either during or at the end of the, the technical talk. Um, so you can submit your questions at any time, so please feel free to do so. It's actually better sometimes to get them in earlier so that we can um, it'll give us a better chance to, um, to cover them again at the end. There's also a copy of both uh, my introduction presentation and uh, Michal's presentation under the handouts tab, and you can download them if you feel feel feel, feel free to download them. So if you if you like. Um, lastly, when the seminar is concluded, you will receive a very short survey from GoToWebinar. It'll have three questions in it, and we would really appreciate your um, response on that. So just to give you a, a look back at some of our previous technical talks, these were just took place over um, over last year. There is video recordings of all of them on our YouTube channel, so um, and also on the uh, website you can find links to it. So please, if there's anything there that catches your interest, please feel free to um, access those. Um, in, in relation to upcoming talks, obviously we have Michal today, and we have Paul Walsh from SIM coming up at the end of the month, and um, we also have James O'Donnell, Donald, um, who will be doing a, a conference on building performance analysis uh, in the at the start of May. That's, is it, we're looking forward to that um, in-person event. Uh, also, just to touch on the Ashray Learning Institute, and um, there's a lot of courses available online. So um, some free, some some paid, but there's there's a lot of um, knowledge available there to to be accessed. Um, so just to introduce Michal, um, Michal is a mechanical engineer with 24 years of experience in Ireland, UK, and Brazil, in sectors such as food, pharmaceutical design, and project management companies, as well as maintenance and operation of HVAC equipment. Michal is committed to providing low carbon, high efficiency heating and cooling solutions. And today he's going to talk about carbon footprint uh, reduction with CO2 heat pumps. So, so I will hand over to you, Michal, and I'll change presenter there now so you can take over. Great. Thank you very much, Tony, and thank you, Karen. So Michal, you're in, yeah, Great. very good. That looks okay. good, isn't it? Yeah, um, always good to uh, get the technical things out of the way. Very good, okay. Uh, today's obviously seminar is about CO2 and high temperature heat pumps, okay. And con today's context, we have overview and introduction, we'll go to natural heat sources and heat recovery. we we'll look at the high temperature heat pump principles, we'll go to the benefits, from system schematics, then the high temperature applications and case studies. Okay, the sustainable concept behind CO2 heat pumps. So heat pumps use a freely available heat, either directly extracted from the environment or from the building or process. We enhance or upgrade this energy and make it available for reuse in the different system or building. Uh, therefore, they can capture waste heat that would otherwise be dumped to atmosphere. And depending on system design, they upgrade freely available low-grade heat from the 
energy environment and given us an economical use. According from the ASHRA handbook, the heat pump extracts heat source and transfer it to a sink at a higher temperature. So reasons for heat recovery. So first of all, we've got economical. And they are, so basically if you short payback periods, they have a, provide a reduction in the heating system size, a so physical footprint. They give the operation cost savings achieved with energy, food reduction energy and gas. And grants and incentives are available from various savings schemes and further savings from the EU trading emissions system. They help mitigate CO2 emissions and therefore related taxes on sale. And the gives a increase in, in company indirectly in company sales there with company brand image being increased with a green and energy efficient seals. And from an environmental aspect, then they harness and recycle sorry there. Harness and recycle energy and reduce the fossil fuel consumption and CO2 emissions. Then from a regular regular regulatory point of view, then the Coyote Protocol and CO2 emissions, the EU Directive 2018, with the, the total energy savings in buildings and the Directive, which sets out requirements for energy performance buildings and the NZ nearly zero buildings energy performance. So we look at natural heat sources and heat recovery. So this, first of all, for any heat pump, you need a, a source of energy. Okay, so that can be from the environment, from the air, or from, from the ground, or even indeed water. So this can be a large river, lake, or sea. And the ground source, you can have either open loops or closed loops, and they can be in different, different arrays, uh, horizontal or in vertical loops. Okay, remember this ground, there's always uh, energy available in the ground, and it's a fairly constant temperature. And even on air in the, even on cold days, it just the condenser or the fans just need to work a bit harder, but there's always energy available in the air. And again, so it, it can work, sometimes a heat pump can work in reverse and be an air conditioning system. So it depends on sometimes you're blowing actually hotter out or colding out, depending if they work in an air conditioning system or in a heat pump mode. Okay. And again, sources of heat from up to 40 degrees C. It can, it can be slightly higher. We'll go through the temperature ranges shortly. So this can be, again, so water from the dust from buildings, even from people actually indirect from people, from service data centers, again, from processes. Anywhere there's a heat source that can, that can be reused. Okay, there's different, sorry. There's um, using equipment, this is a standard chiller and there's the heat being rejected out to the atmosphere via a cooling tower. With the outside so the projected cooler air, air, heat coming out. With the introduction of a heat, uh, heat exchanger, heat can be recovered back into, say the air system with the, with the supply air and going out going about being supplied outside air going into the supply air and then you can have return air coming in but basically you can, you can do a reheat there and recover some of this heat using the equipment and or else you can have this sometimes you can have a chair then with the doubled heat um, double condenser where the heat recovery is done directly with the within inside the, the chiller itself or the condenser so again if need be if they don't need the heat it's rejected atmosphere otherwise it can be recovered and i'm saying showing here a and they hate you, but it could be indeed could be any any process with a heat exchanger and heat recovery mode here. So basically, you can do it. it doesn't have to be a heat pump, but it's just a way of recovering heat. Okay, we'll just look at some of the principles now of the high temperature heat pumps. Okay, just a quick recap on the refrigeration cycle. You've got the electric input of electrical energy into the the motor 
for the connection to the compressor. So in these cases here, it's a in this system, the CO2 refrigerant is a piston compressor. Okay, obviously in different filtration cycles, you can have different compressed types of compressor, piston, scroll, screw, centrif centrifugal. Okay, working from a clockwise direction, starting from the compressor. Again, this is a closed system, so you've got the refrigerant, and in this case, the refrigerant gas is CO2. It goes from low temperature, low pressure gas, and, and then the compressor will compress it into high temperature and high pressure gas, okay? And this, in a typical chiller, this would be the, the condenser, and it will be rejecting heat of atmosphere, but in this case, it doesn't condense the gas, so it actually, it just cools the gas, okay? That's why it's called a gas cooler. And in this system, we use brace, braised plate heat exchangers. So on one side, you've got the refrigerant. On the other side, then you've got water going out to the processor system. Again, there's the sink side, and the, I'll show you here the evaporator, the source side. It goes from the high, the higher temperature down to low temperature and low pressure by the, in this case, electronic expansion valve. And then it will go into the evaporator. Again, it's a plate heat exchanger. So on this is the source. And again, it's the water. And it will go off to the processor system. Okay. Looking at the internal operation of the system. So here you've got the heat source. And it can be varied from minus 25 degrees right up to 40 degrees C. And so again, the water on this side into the evaporator, so it'll go out colder. So this is a, inverted commas, this is your cold side. Then the, again, refrigerant side here, I'm showing bubbles here again, but remember this is a gas inside of here, okay? So it's not, a, you can never have liquid, as you know, never have liquid going into a compressor because it compresses, not a, not a pump. So always gas going into your compressor. Okay, the introduction of electricity obviously powers the compressor, the motor of the compressor. And again, into the high, High temperature outside, and as I said, this is a gas cooler. So this is the heat source, and on the right hand side of the heat sink. So again, water is coming in here into the heat exchanger or gas cooler. 20, the, the temperatures, inlet temperatures into the, the I would say the hot side in the gas cooler can be ranged from 20 to 40. Actually, it can be above that, say for example, up to 46 degrees, depending on the heat source size. So we're not always limited to these temperatures. And the, more importantly, the output temperatures going from say 65 right up to 110 degrees C. So that's where you're, that's why it's called a high temperature heat pump. Most most uh, heat pumps say air cooled are limited there for 65 and, and lower. So that's why, it, okay. And again, the expansion valve and then this completing the unit there. Okay, looking at the thermodynamics, so that's its refrigerant name is R744. Also, it's the refrigerant name for CO2 gas. At this point here, it's called the transcritical point, where it can actually exist in three different stages at one point. So the temperature is 31 degrees C and a pressure of seven, almost 74 bar. So it must be noted that um, the pressures are higher than typical refrigerants. Okay, so we're going, in some cases, going up to 120 bar. And the, the zone of operation there is normally above the critical point here. So let's we'll show that in the next slide. So on the TS diagram, you've got, and taken to this different stages there on the diagram. So the black line represents the refrigerant inside the system, okay? So following through here, the one, the compressor going from a low pressure and bring up to two, then to the high pressure, in this case, 120 bar. Then it drops down then in, before going into the, into the evaporator, it goes across the expansion valve, drops in pressure, and then goes into the four, then where it changes the temperature. And before going back into the compressor again, before it's lifted back up into going from low pressure right up to high pressure in, inside the compressor. And so then on the, the blue is your, the temperature there on the, the source side, heat source. So the obviously the temperature goes out, goes in warmer and goes out cooler. So it goes in warmer here, goes out cooler. And the hot side again, it gets in 
say in fact, commas colder and goes out hotter. Okay, so in and out there. So there it is on the different the diagrams. You can see the the temperatures there. In this case here, it's a 90 degrees heat. The water is heated up to 90 degrees, and you are going in approximately 30 degrees. There's your delta T there on the hot side. Okay, on the cold side, roughly going in and going in at about circa 10 degrees and out at eight to five to six degrees. Okay. Here's a, just a, an image there of the system of a, a heat pump itself. And there's the piston compressors on top and noting that everything is insulated here. So on the chiller, you're not going to insulate on the, the condenser side because you don't want to waste this heat. But in this case, you want to, everything is insulated because you want to recover as much energy as, as possible. And again, the, depending on size, then they're being increased in footprint depending on the number of compressors and system size. Okay, we'll look at some of the benefits of the CO2 heat pump technology. Again, first of all, we've got cold heat coupling. A single machine can heat and cool. You've got a very large temperature range, you know, so from minus 20 right up, then up to 110 degrees, and you can simultaneously heat and cool. So this is a big advantage then of these systems. It doesn't just heat, just cool, or doesn't just heat, it actually does both, one machine does both. And that's where you get to large COPs and large efficiencies from these systems. Okay, they've got short pay payback periods. So there's a using a conventional technology. It's an actual example, and it was, came in at 226,000 and versus the heat pump. So then there's 80K savings. So that looked, that's a 35% operational cost then and a return on investment of less than two years. Uh, as I said, there's large range of the capacities going from, from a small single unit then from a 50 kilowatt unit going right up then to 1.4 megawatts of, of heating and the cooling is, is proportional to this. And again, with high COPs, coefficient of performances. Looking at some natural benefits of the CO2 refrigerant. So first of all, there's no legal restrictions and planning investment and no disposal recycler restraints and no available restrictions. And I've seen the ASHRA a presentation is very interesting on the FGAS regulations and it actually discusses the, the mm. restrictions on some other gases have some been phased out. So with, with the CO2 gas, you won't have, it's always going to be available. Again, it's a safer gas. It's compared to all the other refrigerants. Um, it's in the A1 class. It's low safety requirements. It's non-toxic, non-flammable, non-caustic, and non antioxidant also. Uh, however, there are pressures are are high pressures. But again, the system is designed for these high pressures. And again, CO2 detection comes in standards on the on this equipment. Then it's climate friendly. It's a natural refrigerant and frequency rate. Um, it's not uh, highly effective and it doesn't deplete the ozone layer and doesn't cause global warming. So, uh, I said it's we don't use fossil fuels, uh, the reduction elimination of the natural gas. Uh, there's no reduced obligations for it because natural refrigerant, low maintenance, and very robust equipment, and then it can optimize for the image. And heat sources come right up then from 40. I'm going up to do the up to the 110, and you can very different source it can be air, ground, buildings, data centers, dust process, or even CHP combined heat and power. And so the different examples here, different different buildings or process. Okay, we we'll now look at some system schematics. So here we have the traditional heating and cooling system or you've got the chill water on the left. And in this case, it's a water cooled chiller. So you've got a cooling tower. And again, as I said, you can see the heat being rejected off to atmosphere. Okay, and then you'd also need a boiler with input of gas, heating up the water, but also these emissions then as well. So this is, everybody wants, wants to reduce or eliminate these. Again, but it heats up. But with the heat pump, then it combines both of these in one machine. So it cools and heats on, on the one machine. Okay. 
bringing your temperatures right up then to 110 degrees, depending on the set point required. It's just an example here. Okay. And if in the case there are certain limitations, remember this is the like any any we'll say chiller, it, there are limitations. So less than the case there was no need for a low temp lower temperatures. I need you you can actually use a separate heat exchanger within the heat pump itself and then you can then go off to a different process. So different temperatures are achievable within the heat pump. So this case is 15 going in 15 degrees and out up to 21 and then the main heating then going off to the to the, to the system. And again this is actually taken from a actual process. Okay and again the cooling on the left. And again because in Ireland we've got a lot of Sometimes you don't have, well, a lot of the times you don't have greenfield sites. So again, sometimes you have to mix it with existing what's there and the company has limited space, limited resources, et cetera. So we're always tying in with existing systems. So for example, an air cool chiller, and it's, tie, it's then your, your cooling, but also you've got a hot system, hot water come back in from industrial, say in this case, industrial example, it goes into the heat pump, you can go into the buffer storage here, if not unless the, this low grade heat is not needed, it can be rejected by the dry cooler. If they have the existing gas boilers that can be kept and tied in. And again, it can be tied in a kind of hybrid system that even if you have the air source heat pump, you can do the heating with air too as well. So again, every, as you know well, these, every system is different too as well. So it's just to get an idea of the, the different applications. So just a brief overview of some of the some of the factors here. We'll actually dive into the detail now on the next slide. So it's a small unit, 50 kilowatt. It's a Frankfurt base uh, hospital in Frankfurt, heating of 50 kilowatts and the, in a temperature of 40 degrees and going in heated right up to 80 degrees. And that's and then your source then going. 12 degree inlet water temperature and then going out going out at six. So then there's the capacity of the heating and the capacity of cooling. So 50 and 33 kilowatts. So an overall combined heating cooling COP of 5.2. This avoids 350 tons of CO2 per year. And it's a schematic of same. So you've got the, the heat pump. And the cold side and the hot side and then the reason why sometimes we put in these buffer storage uh, system just to even out the even out the loads some may, may not necessarily be required but it does it can help there on equalizing the loads and depending on loading and loading the system too as well when there's less demands okay so it can just help even out the system and it make this even even more efficient okay next one again a small machine Again, heating the grade for heating the water from 40 right up to 80 degrees, and then cooling the water from 21, cooling it down then to 10 degrees. This avoids small unit, avoids 30 tons per annum, and a payback there of two and a half years. Again, say it's a university. And it's very interesting, but that it, because the source of heat then is actually from air conditioning systems, small mini, mini split units. And from a from a cooling system, and going into the heat pump, and then going into buffering tanks, going into the hot water system, and indeed heating hot water there via a heat exchanger going out for for drinking and domestic purposes. Uh, so just an overview of cost that was 178k. So the look, uh, reduction heat losses. They've achieved the appropriate temperatures. And even pump flows, so overall improvement in system operation and ROI return investment of 2.4 years. Next example then is a, a cosmetics site. And again, it's one heat pump, a larger machine here, but just shy of 200 kilowatts of heating. And again, you can have different operating conditions. As I say, there are different operating conditions depending on summer and winter demands. Okay, so the, the various different loadings then as well. That obviously in the winter you're going to have higher 
higher cooling require or heating requirements and then vice versa there in the, in the winter okay so an overall cop of 6.8 and it avoids 95 tons of co2 per annum and a payback there of two and a half years there's a picture of the heat pump itself quite a compact unit and they just uh, these units will go indoors actually they could shelter can be located outdoor but in general they go inside with inside the plant room again but they've a very small footprint there let me again this is the schematic of same this is the interesting there on the site they actually tied it into a ground source into a number of array in the ground and depending on the temperatures that is valid because the winter and the summer summer temperatures and sometimes it's a heat extraction sometimes heat generation so by directly by a heat exchanger here and you can you can basically reject or take the heat from the system again another source of the heat then is from the data center from cooling the the server room basically going going into the going in in at uh, 10 degrees and going out of four by, by or in the hotter temperatures then it's going at 28 and going out at 18 so depending on summer and winter conditions conditions and then it heats up the system too as well again as there was an existing border there was left can the boiler can be left there for supplemental purposes and they, there was an existing chiller that was kept again again for for redundancy or supplemental reasons too uh this is a, again larger machine 300 just above 300 kilowatts of heating and cooling 200 kilowatts uh, it gives a combined cop of 4.6 uh there it is there isn't it like the best photograph there but it gives an idea there as well and then another second heat pump then with the vse variable speed drive again to modulate even further the, the capacity and uh, it's a larger machine the 400 kilowatts of heating and just 260 kilowatts then of cooling again there's your temperatures so going in at 40 going out 80 on the hot side and going in at 12 and out at six on the, on the cold side again so you have your, your loading pattern again in the winter you've got the highest heating demand and then in summer you've got the highest cooling demand so it's a case of matching these loads there and getting the correct size machine and that's where your, your buffering can help out too as well this is the schematic of same again the two heat pumps here sorry the two the the, the chillers and then the new heat pump are going to buffer buffer system and then this is your it recovers heat then from the the cooling towers it can heat it heated right up then as well into out there for 80, 80 degrees then depending on on the system demand again there's a cold side giving chilled water out there at six degrees this is a industrial application where you've got a the, the existing borders there as well again they were kept again for redundancy there's the heat pump not the, the chiller and then the heat pump's not the not the best photograph but 130 kilowatts of heat of uh, heating so again your temperatures in this case 85 degree going in at 40 and the cooling of 170 kilowatts going in at nine out at five so it provides the base load there for the heating and the cooling and it's pretty much 24 7 operation this avoids 114 tons per annum per year and a very short one and a half year payback this is the schematic schematic of a meat processing plant actually this is this particular one is in, installed in korea and so quite a large unit just shy of one megawatt of of heating and the, well, the heat source in this case is the def ammonia refrigeration plant and instead of wasting this heat going off to atmosphere they put in a heat exchanger and uh, they can buffer this heat and by the pump going into the cold side the evaporator of the heat pump 
and going out cold. Okay, so it's, it's helping to alleviate the load there on the, the cooling towers and indirect systems. So it provides this basically free energy here, it upgrades it, and it heats the fresh water intake where it goes into 15 degrees and goes right up out at 70. So that's the again, there's a sort of loud swing there as well. One machine can bring it right up to 170 degrees. And this is a goes out to CI cleaning in place and process process um, cleaning. Again, so uh, even the coefficient of the heating there is 4.8. This is the, the machine itself, this is your VSD. And again, the, as the all pipes are insulated then for, for heat recovery. So you can just get an idea of the, the footprint of saying to them. Uh, this is a, a data center for district heating. Again, one heat pump and to 25 degree cooling water and used to 7 degrees heating and it's output of um, 370 kilowatts. Again, the photograph saying. This is just a very overview of the schematic. You've got the server room, again, they generate heat. Normally, again, it's wasted. This, this heat is recovered by a heat exchanger, goes into the heat pump, so into 25, out at 18 degrees. And this heat is upgraded. And then heating in the return water here, coming in from this residential system. And going out at 70. And then this the all it's combined then with a, a power plant to well, right, another heat exchange for the power plant. So again, they can these districts at this moment, okay, they're just to be started, they're installed in Ireland uh, district heating systems and, and who knows in the future, probably district cooling systems. So they're an ideal for heating, cooling. They they can both cool and heat again in the one machine. This uh Smaller unit here, 430 kilowatts of heating and just shy of, of uh, 330 of cooling. And overall, a very impressive over COP of 7.3. It's a lead platinum building. And yeah, so this is during the installation there of the, of the same. And look at the, the plastics in industry again. Show up half a megawatt again. It gets uh, different temperatures here in this case. I just showed previously, you got the 79. There's one stage there, it brings 70 degrees up to 90 degrees. And the first stage, the gas cooler, and the second stage, then it heats the water from 35 to 45. And overall, the heating of one megawatt and the cooling of 700 kilowatts. So, overall, the heating COP. 3.2 and the cold of 2.2. So it's an overall COP of 5.4. Uh, so no additional refrigeration machine was acquired, saves 1,600 tons of CO2. So it's, it's quite impressive there as well. Most, most systems are pumping CO2 into the environment and it's actually saving it. And a payback then of two years. This is the schematic of same. So you're chilled cold water side or source and the sink and this was showing here so it's used for facility heating and that's going into the, the hot water system and this is another example here of the heat pump so i like this one because this uh, it recovers heat from compressed air from air compressors this is a typical it's very rare that I've seen heat uh, recovered from the compressors and then blow out a lot of a lot of hot air out of these machines. It's just pretty much wasted because they some chillers will have even sorry one, some compressors actually even have because they cool down the air. They have a refrigeration system inside them, so actually use even more consume even more energy. So this heat can be harnessed and going through the heat pump then can be sent to a useful heat upgrading it. Again, this is. They also take water from the flotation tank, from, from refrigeration systems, smaller ones and larger ones. And it's a reduce of 2.25 megawatts, megawatts per annum. And so it's 500 tons then of CO2 emissions. So again, a very simple and reliable operation system. Okay, like this is this is actually just in one in Cork, but it's actually a it's not CO two and it's a air source heat pump. Okay, so it gives a a yes ER of three point six two and a seasonal COP of 
at 3.3, and it is the frequent R 410A. Okay. And again, so this is a another system example where you can have a combination. This is a, an air cooled chiller, but also this could be a, a water cooled chiller to resolve a combination. And then because it's going to be the it does the chilling, you're going to have a buffer tank, goes to the heat pump. In this case, heating the water from 40 degrees right up to 90 degrees. And then it can be combined at the existing boiler. And then there's the fresh water intake. These are typical temperatures in Ireland here of the, say, your inlet water that's pretty much coming in cold. And it can, you can buffering it and it heats up this water. And the user return temperature going out to the various different uses there at different temperatures depending on, on the, the requirements. Okay, uh, probably a little bit ahead of time there. So if you've got any questions and other observations there, I would be more than happy, happy to take them now. Thank you very much. Well, thanks so much. That was great. Um, I have a couple of questions I might start things off with. I have a little bit of experience with, with CO2 heat pumps um, and they're, it's a fantastic technology to see, you know, incoming water at 10, 11 degrees coming out at plus 70 and with a good COP, it's, it's, it's phenomenal. Um, I suppose the, the question around that was always the application. It was the, the application was always tricky, certainly uh, that, I, what I, that I found that the CO2 heat pump needed that high lift in the temperatures to get that good COP. I suppose, how have, has the technology moved on in the, let's say the 10 years since I've dealt with it and, and how do you, um, I suppose, how do you, how do you connect it into a, a, an existing system that requires, let's say, a, a, a much smaller temperature band? Yeah. Okay. That's a very good question there as well. So, no. You're right, as I showed on one of the previous slides, well, a second heat exchanger can go within the machine itself. So that's kind of one different, I'm not sure they have, it, it's basically a, like a sub cooler. So you can have two different heats, two different grades of heat going off to do different processes. Now, I, I, let me jump back to the actual. There, sorry. Yeah, this one here. So there, this is actually within the machine and there's two heat exchangers inside it. So let's say there is no need for this lower grade heat. Sometimes this can be a dry air cooler and it can be reject the atmosphere, which is in some ways is no different to an, an existing system. And, but the last thing you want to do is, is turning this thing on. And again, another thing as I suppose buffering is, is key to as well. You can store it and, and operating the heat pump then at, at different different times. Okay, so there's again your hot side and then and then the, you have the different temperatures here. Now, for example, I was talking again the for example temperature of it also depends on your source site temperatures that are involved. For example, just wondering looking at an application where the heating say in your hot side. They require it can actually take a temperature here of 46 degrees coming back in here and going out at 60 degrees okay so from 46 going up to 60 degrees and the cold side then it goes in at 20 degrees here and out at 15 okay so again that's why every single when we get inquiries then we have to look at at the one requirements uh, and and look at every single one there's no it's not we're just a case of having a load of stock and sending it out so every single temperature has to be analyzed both in your cold side and on the hot side okay but i hope that can answer some of your question too as well but if we can look at, at temperatures and you know from an engineering point of view i think when we're rejecting the heat i think any any systems need to be in some ways systems that need to be re, and buildings need to be redesigned to you know, energy is, is by the day is not get is getting more expensive, and CO two is. is uh, I, I think that goes it. for any heat pump as well, Mihal. In fairness, that um, you know, just you can't just drop a heat pump into a system designed for a high temperature boiler. You have to reconsider the the system as a whole, 
um, and and then you know change the operation and the inst the installation as well. Yeah. But, um, that, that's, yeah. That's right. And then sometimes that's why we do you know depending on the system you can actually leave the different boilers there to supplement. So let remember the, the graph I showed there the very high temperatures for heating it can supplement here. So it means you don't have to go to the larger size here because obviously there's a capital cost for this. So let's say it's for the two months or one month during the year, you, you're doing an extra topping up temperature. Well, then you use the boiler there as well. And then this operates in a, in a happier or more constant loading and it, it's get a, getting better payback because it's in, within those ideal conditions. Okay, It's another way of, of uh, keeping capital costs down and, and the efficiencies up in these machines. Yeah, and that's so you're taking that holistic view of the systems with the ideally with the with both sides of the heat pump the cooling and the and the, um, the heat yeah and uh, course, yeah sorry, go ahead. good right. there's one other question just moving on in relation to maintenance of these systems you mentioned the the high pressure is 120 bar and so on what what are the let's say the processes and what's the the, the safety precautions involved in, in maintaining a unit with that type of um, gas pressure yeah, well, obviously, first of all, uh, to be qualified technicians to work on high pressure systems too, as well. But uh, it is the 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 different. Uh, the, first of all, the ratings of of the the piper too, as well. It's all called welding too, as well. So all the fittings are rated for the high pressures. Again, it's very very similar to existing um, chillers too, as well. So there's no additional different uh, measures they have but again one thing that it, it is important to say that uh, the it does come with a gas uh, detection system so it it would you know in the event of, a, of a escape gas then it, it'll tie into the building management system or evacuation system or depending on the size of the plant room as well so that would be again that should be looked at the at the time of, of installation I've another question here now. This may have been answered slightly in relation to my question as well, but what would be the separate cooling and heating COP? Um, and can you please advise on different conditions and design temperature on heating and cooling? What would be the expected COP? So maybe you might reiterate some elements there around COP and, um, and the different conditions for design temperature on heating yeah. and cooling. Yeah, so basically the reason why I give a lot of these examples as well, so it's based on actual um, temperatures. So, um, if anybody wants to contact it directly, they can do as well for, for, for those, like how much, depending on the heating cooling nodes, but there there's some examples of the, your, your COPs have all combined, you know, so obviously they're added, added together. And you know, so the, I think I can separate out. Yeah, so there's again just some of the combined ones as well. So, to, so it, for it, a standard heat pump, you you would say about a, a tree, a COP in around three would be good. You'd be happy with that. Yeah. But you're 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 pushing towards seven then with uh, the combined. Right. And even going up, it can even go up to ten too as well. But you know, better off air on the side of caution too as well. But it can, it can get a lot higher too as well. And and so that's the. That's why we'll always aim at, sorry, we'll always aim at, you know, sizing the machine to get the best COPs because then you're best, you've got the best payback periods to, to as well. So again, it's it's the sizing for the right temperatures and the right demand and and don't obviously over or under under sizing it too as well. And then that's where the control and buffering. So that's uh, in as in, in complement to your previous point as well. The the, the control. I think it should be important of these things well to optimize when it should be used. You know, be be a day at night. And uh, one interesting thing too is all that the, the these machines we do like to would say inverted commas work hard because then that produces more heat. You know, so the it's different to some some equipment then as well that they start to work with partial load or even more efficient. So you do want to inverted commas make these machines work because they they, they provide your heating then. Okay. So could I just kind of kind of wrap that a small bit in in relation to to get it right? It's about the application, the sizing, and then the operating strategy to try and to to get to those high COPs. Would that be fair? That's exactly it. Yes. Yeah. So let me again. That's why. I, yeah, that's why you know looking at every different single system, you can tie it into really say. It's either a new build or an existing build. I can send this air, but this could also be a water cool system too as well. And then, you know, 
and again, what depends where the building is located, like is, is located near a large river or lake. Can, can again, obviously, there's an environmental aspects to as well, but uh, sometimes you've got, you know, for example, a large factory, you might have tanks that are available or that, that can be used there as a source. And uh, uh, and, and then combined to different buffer tanks. So I think it, it's it looking at a holistic holistic system. What what's available, and then control of same tools are like like uh, operating it at different different time loadings to as well, and and then seeing what what the customer requires to as well. Okay, so there is like a holistic is so uh, yeah. Another one going back onto the service side, Michal, for you. Um, what is the level of service? support available in Ireland at the moment for these type of machines? Are, are the skills there? Is there experience there? Is there is there many of the CO2 machines installed? Yeah, of, of these particular from from NG, or sort of from, the, from, the, from, from these particular brand there, they haven't installed one as of yet in Ireland. Uh, there are other CO2 heat pumps installed in Ireland. Um, we have the team and, and capability of uh, and support both from uh, remotely and on, on site in Ireland to maintain and operate these 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 heat pumps. You know. Another one in relation to operation. Um, how do these units respond to load fluctuations with regard to turn down ratio? And can yeah, a number so of units be sequenced? They can indeed, yeah. And that's one of the reasons why some units they can again Sometimes it would recommend a VST or variable speed drive, and sometimes not. And depending, basically sequences, it, it, they, that's why they've got a number of compressors to as well, because you can you can load them up partially then with, with as more load comes on, more compressors can be sequenced on and off. And with the VSD, it'll ramp up your with the, the partial loads. And again, depending on system design, then on the heating required, maybe splitting it up into two different heat pumps to as well. So again, I have to, I have to look at the, System design, but yes, between the VSDs, there are various different compressors, and even and even compressor sizes. There's a number of ways of, and and in addition to that, the the buffering too as well can can help then for loading and loading and, and taking out these peaks and troughs of, of say if there's low demand systems and, and high demands on the system. There's a question around application here for you, Michal. Um, say taking a data center application and if there was um, a district heating connection so you're, you're you're dropping that waste heat into the district district heating system in the summer period when you don't have that load available to you are you looking at a dry cooler or what would be the the the, the heat dump in that in that scenario yeah again that it depends on your in the temperature going into the on the hot side we'll say uh, it, it could be a case that a, a dry air cooler is needed. And again, the last thing, you, you don't want to be running these dry air coolers because that's your, you, you, that's when it, it becomes the same as a, as a, a chiller by, by dumping heat, you know. So again, that, that should be sized correctly. And I think in looking at the, the best application, that's why I think even in Ireland, they're looking for me personally. I, Where's the swimming pool? Where's the Olympic size swimming pool beside these places to beside these data centers? I think we have to start looking at redesigning some some uh, environment things. Don't just stick heat uh, data centers produce heat, but is this heat captured or reused? No. So I think find something. You know, maybe some crazy ideas, but maybe an ice cream factory should go next to a, the data centers or <laughs> use the cooling and heating some of these systems. You know. I think there's going to maybe some out of the box thinking is required. Yeah, and we certainly could do with a few more uh, Olympic sized swimming pools, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so there's a question here in relation to a controller. Um, so the heat pump works as part of a system. How easy is it to integrate into a building wide control system such as BMS, so I think it's yeah. back -net connections and so on? That's right. So it's quite easy because all, all these heat pumps will, will come with a, with a BMS card and to. to, to Basically, talk with the the existing BMS system, so integrated with it, and then you're and even any different faults or alarms or temperatures and or when it should be loading. And even in, in a case as well, these they can you know it sometimes you want running hard, but it, sometimes it can. And again, this is going back to your COPs and the fine tuning of it. You know the operation. Do you want it unloaded or loaded up? Because they can actually cool 
could it can be operate in Verticom as a chill or two as well, by, by just depending what is the set point of this machine. To understand, I know it's a little bit, maybe not everybody get that, but basically uh, depending on, on the set point and depending on how, how much you want to load, load or unload this, okay? And, and, and the temperatures that are, are basically going in and out of it. Uh, and again, uh, yeah. going back to that previous point about operation, that's a, a critical element to it, making sure that the, the operation of this is is suitable to the to the type of heat pump it is. is that Correct. Fair? That's right. Uh, yeah, it is. And also, there is a, a range both on the the minimum and maximum ranges, both on the the cold side on the hot side. You know. So the, again, a, when we're doing the selection, let's say they want such and such temperature, we'll say, okay, but this is your minimum and this is your maximum. On a, this is your range that you can do that. And then there is there is kind of an optimum, but that's where you, the main thing is to run the machine at the optimum. So obviously it may run suboptimum then at some parts or periods during the year, but then again, if it's over the year, then it'll, it'll smoothen itself out and, and it gets your capital return back then in a number of years. So just to, to wrap up, Miho, with the final, it's, it's more of a comment than a, a question, but as someone mentions um, 120 bar would be similar to traditional hydraulic applications. So there's obviously a lot of skill sets in place around hydraulics. So um, I presume that's the, the gist of it. Yeah, and again, remember, but this is this, the pressure that stays within inside the skid too as well. So this mm -hmm. is, it's localized within house, but on, on the, the heat pump skid. It's not as if the pressure goes out to the system too as well. Just yeah. it's, and, and you know the, your, the flange connections and the, the, the end you just tie up to these or to the hot and the cold side. Fantastic. I think that's the lot of our questions. Yeah, that's a lot. So what I'm going to do now is just um, I'm going to do a few closing slides. Is there anything else, Michal, you'd like to mention on before we finish up? Well, that's, that's, that's it. If anybody wants to contact me, they can. And uh, again, we'll, we'll go through a different, whatever potential application they'd have. So if they even have additional questions, then you can send me an email. Okay, and thank you very much again for the opportunity, Tony. Thank you so much, Mio. So I hope my screen has come up there. So just as closing announcements, just to wrap it up. Um, so the the board of Ashray Ireland, just to give you a look. Daniel is president, um, Conor Murray vice president. Um, we're always looking for, first of all, we're always looking for new members for Asher Island. And um, we're certainly always looking for new volunteers to, to help with different aspects um, of, of running the organization. And there's still spaces on the board. Um, so if anyone is interested in getting involved, we would be delighted to hear from you. Um, in relation to keeping up to date with uh, any of the events such as this web technical webinar, um, please follow us on uh, Twitter or LinkedIn. Also register for our our um, our emails, our email alerts. Um, all of the previous webinars, as I mentioned, are on the YouTube channel, so you can find that also there. And uh, sorry, it's to subscribe to our mailing list. Yeah, you'll find it here on the Ashray Island website under mailing list. And a final thank you to all of our sponsors and supporters who make all of these events possible and um, very important to us. And um, yeah, so thank you very much. And that's it. So as I said, this um, webinar was recorded. Um, so if you want to look back at anything, um, the, it'll be available on our website and YouTube, YouTube channel and um, also on the handouts they're available so um, please do um, contact us if you have any other further questions and we can pass them on to me all um, thanks and that's that for today cheers <laughs>